everybody, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to have a conversation about responsible innovation. And when I heard about your work in that space, I was wondering, is there any investor or any company that would say what we're doing is irresponsible innovation? So how do you make sure that there is sort of meat to that promise? Yeah. Um, first of all, I'm actually very excited to be here. I, uh, I was there, I was telling you backstage, in 2017, launching our first book called Unscaled. And a lot of this work has been a continuation of the thinking from there. Look, <clears throat> responsible innovation for us is a framework for building enduring companies that are built for both growth and good. Uh, I think it's rejecting the, the Milton Friedman philosophy that the sole purpose of corporations is to maximize shareholder value. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's, uh, it's based on the insight that the very best companies are only going to be created at the intersection of financial and societal return. So there's a false choice that are you doing an impact-based business or are you building a financially lucrative business. I don't think that's the way innovation is going to take hold in the future. Mm -hmm. And so when you decide sort of, you know, what to focus on and how to define what is responsible, how do you get input from society, from different communities, or is it all data-driven? How, how do you measure and, and choose, basically well, govern for, for that's responsibility? I think that's exactly it. It really is about, and I'd like to ask you this question as well, it really is about understanding all the stakeholders that a business impacts, right? And so for us, it starts first and foremost with intentionality and impact. What is the transformation or the change in the world the business is trying to do? Mm -hmm. Uh, being intentional about who are the, all the stakeholders and how do you make sure you are creating economic opportunity and inclusion, sustainability of the planet, uh, right? The privacy, security, and uh, issues around sort of harbor, uh, creating a safe digital community, um, sort of, and then also sort of thinking through workforce transformation. Every time you bring technology in, are you killing jobs? Are you creating jobs? And, uh, you know, I know you think about this from the policy side a lot. So I don't know if you want to comment on your perspective in terms of how does the regulation play a role in making sure the, the innovation diaspora is headed towards a responsible set of businesses. Yeah, so I, I think it's a, it's a question of who gets to decide, right? Because... <clears throat> For the longest time, we heard from Silicon Valley investors, founders, CEOs, that they were creating good for society, more freedoms for more people, uh, the ability to connect, and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, a lot of very bitter lessons have been learned about unintended consequences, maybe tunnel vision to focus on one thing, could be scale, <coughs> could be profit, could be the good intentions with which people have built advertising giants but either in their own communities or on the other end of the world, sometimes disasters happened. Yeah. Uh, and the, the motto was still, oh, we do no evil, and you know, we're here for, for the benign uh, purposes. And so I think what's really key is that one, governments set parameters within which companies can, can operate so that there's not sort of um, hope as a strategy. But also, I'm, I'm curious to hear whether you think that, you know, the way you see this, not focusing just on scale, not focusing just on profits, are you swimming against the current or is this the new current? Yeah. Is there a changing of minds? Yeah, so look, first of all, let's think about what's actually happening. <clears throat> when I got in the business 20 years ago, all of technology investing was about uh, driving efficiency, right? Software was there to make lives efficient for consumers, for supply chain managers, for doctors. And then when you think about what we do today, we actually build banks, we build insurance companies, we build healthcare services, schools. So the sense of responsibility is far greater. And um, from our standpoint, all these innovations where we're fundamentally transforming these core pillars of the economy are at the intersection of technology, policy, and capital. Mm -hmm. Right, And so I always think about it saying, well, policymakers have to, th to say, here's the frameworks. But then as company builders, we need to have frameworks. We need to have the mindset and the mechanisms that lead to the creation of these companies that are, again, built for growth and good. What are, what is, what are those mechanisms? Those are things like business model choices. Those are things like, are you measuring the use of AI and second order effects through algorithmic canaries on the different stakeholders. 
are you building a diverse uh, team and culture so you have an understanding of all the stakeholders? So as, as investors and company builders, all we can focus on is the inputs. And that really is what responsible innovation is at, uh, at a core, which is what are the inputs to building these businesses that can uh, endure for a long time? And I just want to say, I'm a hardcore venture capitalist, care deeply about driving the best returns for our investors. So with my venture capital hat on, the reason this matters <clears throat> is because the very best companies, very best investments compound for a long time. Mm -hmm. And the companies that get to compound for a long time are the ones that society allows to compound, which means they have to be fundamentally in the interest of society. And that's why this is also important. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at that triangle of technology, uh, policy, and capital, um, in the United States, which is where your company is based, we see a sort of policy paralysis, right? There is a bit of catching up. Some proposals are being made, but it's not a secret that the U.S. Congress is deeply divided. And you just spoke about company and investor responsibility. How do you, uh, how do you foresee the next decade, for example? Do you think there will be movement coming out of the U.S. Congress, out of lawmakers, whether at the state or the national level? Uh, in Europe, much more is happening. Or do you really think it will fall upon the shoulders of investors and CEOs to sort of take their own values compass, their own governance hats, and to hold themselves to account uh, in some ways as well. I think the productivity of the government, you might have a better answer on. I mean, like, I, I, mean I, I, I personally believe that uh, in the principle of radical collaboration, that we actually got to have that dialogue between the company builders and the regulators. I feel like we're leaving the regulators behind quite a bit. So when you think about the way the government used to you know, even manage antitrust policies. Like in the Microsoft days, they would go send people on campus and see um, are they following the right practices or not. Today, in the world of software and algorithms, do you send people to stare at the servers in the Facebook data room? So I think, I think there's such a big gap in terms of how tech companies are being built and what the government actually understands that on its own, I don't think the right policies will come about. I, I, I think this needs to be a responsibility of the the technology folks, and this is where, you know, maybe you can comment on just what you think could be those best practices to bring that collaboration together, but we got to bring the regulators along. They don't understand any of this stuff. Well, I think you're, you're pointing to what is actually a, a painful truth, uh, is that it's yeah. hard for not only regulators, but also politicians, journalists, citizens, civil society leaders to actually not only understand, which requires certain skills, but to what also have the right it? access to information. I yeah. mean, so much of the details of how companies are run, how data is collected, how data is processed, how AI works, is hidden from scrutiny at the moment. And it's also uh, fluid, it changes all the time because there's evolution through machine learning and other kinds of, of mechanisms. So I would imagine actually that regulators are going to have some kind of accounting standards of how to keep track yeah. of processes that are happening inside companies in order to then ensure more liability and accountability. Are, are there one or two ideas emerging there that you feel like have legs that we ought to build on? <clears throat> well, when I... Um, spoke to Vice President Vestager, who is responsible for tech policy for the European Union, but also uh, antitrust. She actually shared that she foresees um, technology regulating technology. So, you know, sort of oversight um, algorithms, for lack of better, better words, to see whether companies are adhering to the law. And I, I personally fundamentally believe that, you know, non-discrimination principles, access to information, independent oversight, antitrust. It shouldn't matter whether they are at stake uh, in the automobile sector, for example, or in the hospitality business or online, right? So... Yeah, I mean, I I, by, by, by the way, it's interesting you say that. Um, I think this was in 2016 when Secretary Pritzker came over to the Bay Area and she said, what should the Commerce Department do? And I basically said, you need to build an AI department in the Commerce Department that actually knows how to measure the consequences of a lot of the AI that, and technology that's being used in, in, in the tech companies, because it really does need to be some sort of a software-defined governance model uh, going forward, right? I mean, I think that's a little bit of what you're alluding to. Yeah, but when you're talking about this collaboration, 
I think we're at a moment where there's very low trust, yeah. very low trust between politicians, but also low trust from public officials to tech leaders. I hate to say it, but I think no, it's, no, it's, it's a, true. I, but uh, and no so argument there. How, how do you think you and you know your peers can contribute to regaining that trust? I think without more transparency, without more accountability, those collaborations will also be prone to fail because it will just be really hard to, to um, have a sort of shared understanding yeah. of why it matters to have rules and, and some kind of um, adherence to those rules for everybody. Yeah. Look, <clears throat> the reason I'm here is because I think we need a movement. We need a movement around a fundamentally different set of practices to company building, and that's this whole framework for responsible innovation as we're talking about it. That's the only way it's going to happen. I think it requires bringing the stakeholders together. It requires upfront being intentional about what we're doing. I think the, the traditional mindset in, in technology, before it was building those core services in society, used to be move fast and break things, right? And the reason was because it was an engineering design principle. It's not a societal design principle. And so I think the rethinking, now that technology is very mainstream and the stakes are really high, what does it mean in terms of intentionality which, which we should be building? I, th I, th I think if we're not thinking about that, then we're going to end up creating a digital society that's not equitable. And again, uh, there will be no tech. If, if that is how we build companies. We won't be allowed to build companies in the long run because, uh, you know, uh, to me that leads down a very ugly path of a revolution as opposed to having a harmonious society. Mm -hmm. And we all know that governments have very uh, expensive IT contracts, right? The, the procurement and the buying by governments of technologies for tax databases, for smart cities, for healthcare, for all kinds of services is also uh, a big... Uh, market for tech companies. How do you think governments could sort of create more responsible innovation markets through procurement and through regulation? So not only to say these are the limits of what companies can do, but also this is where we want to see uh, the targets going, society going, and the, the parameters going through uh, contracts, not only through uh, yeah, it's, it, it's So uh, in the U.S., the Department of Energy, when they created ARPA-E, did a little bit of that, which was, hey, to the extent that we want to uh, solve for a clean, affordable, secure energy future, here are some parameters. We want to get certain technologies to certain cost structures, or we want to have you know, uh, certain emission guidelines, and let's go build, innovate in the context of that. So I think that policy frameworks, going back to it, does help. But I'm also very excited about uh, prioritization of a lot of the work in government. I mean, think about the innovations in de defense and security and uh, other areas. I do think, and, and even, you know, things like social security and welfare, the government is leaning on the private sector to say, come solve these problems for us, here's our guidelines, and, and build businesses within those guidelines for the stakeholders that we care about. So that is starting to happen. I actually think we have, come, we have a fantastic company called City Block that goes and delivers healthcare services to the Medicaid population. And it's off of CMS contracting with states, and it's all about how do you deliver to these underserved communities, you know, proactive uh, healthcare. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a fantastic business being built. So I think I think there's a lot of proof points like that, which we'll look back in five years and say that has already begun. I totally agree that the sort of privatization in some areas, yeah, is yeah. happening. Yeah. But I'm I'm curious how it adds up between the notion of a lack of understanding yeah. and a greater leaning on the private sector. So let's take, for example, security and defense, right? It's one of the key tasks that state, states have in their constitutions. States used to have a monopoly on the use of force. Right now, you could argue that uh, risk, risk scans on the network, private companies. Defending critical infrastructure, private companies creating offensive capabilities, private companies. So how, how do you imagine five, 10 years out that the sort of understanding in order to have good oversight and, and sort of responsibility taken also by those governments who are engaging those private companies, how that gets better aligned? Yeah, so I think, I think um, the way I think about it is the prioritization 
in the context of policy that exists. The spirit of the, the policies go obsolete when societies change and more technology is adopted and you live differently uh, as the different stakeholders. But the spirit of those policies is actually uh, in some ways the same. So I think, I think the more it's about the intent behind the outcome that the government is trying to drive and, and goes back to the, the way you described it, which is what are the frameworks, what are the outcomes they're trying to see? If those are clear, and uh, then there's always enough arbitrage in terms of privatizing uh, from an economic perspective because there's just so much waste when you have layers of bureaucracy and procurement and other areas that you're talking about that you should be able to build prosperous businesses that, that are very valuable and very consistent with the spirit of the policy. Mm -hmm. But again, this doesn't happen unless there's a true collaboration. In fact, you know, the example I gave of City Block, the reason I think they're very successful is they actually came out of the policy realm into tech and mm -hmm. built this amazing sort of company. So the fact that they had uh, a core understanding of the spirit of what was trying to be accomplished. So the more there's that radical collaboration between technology and policy, the more I think these businesses will be better aligned with uh, uh, you know, the spirit of what these new policies are going after in, in major areas, healthcare or defense and the others we talked about. And w where do you see good examples of such radical collaboration? Are you trying to create it yourself? Have you seen others doing it well? Do you see it in Europe or in the United I, States? <clears throat> I, I deeply believe that this is absolutely necessary. I think uh, the 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 technology diaspora, I was going to say Silicon Valley, but I'm not there in Silicon Valley right now. The technology diaspora is obsessed with the word disruption. And, you know, I, I personally indict the word disruption. So think about, think about what we saw in healthcare with the, with the pandemic in the last couple of years. So many problems that got uh, uh, exposed. You know, as tech folks, we can say we're just going to not have regard for the existing health system. The same people that put their lives at risk for us over the last two years, and we're just going to disrupt it all with some fancy technology. Or you can have empathy for what works, where it's broken, and bring technology to make a difference in empowering them. That mindset of radical collaboration, I think, is starting to happen in healthcare uh, out of necessity over the last couple of years. I actually think that's the model which would, you should be going in, you know, transforming education as an example. The goal isn't to go build. 150,000 new schools. The goal is to figure out how do, how do we really transform the existing infrastructure and train the teachers to think in the world of sort of where we think the 21st century education model. Sort of literally go institution by institution and have that kind of a mindset versus saying we're going to just disrupt it. Mm -hmm. No, I appreciate your criticism of this move fast and break things and, and disruption as the highest order because I think we've all been confronted with, with so many uh, instances where core principles, whether it's, you know, public services like healthcare or our democracy, I mean, it's a very serious matter, should not be disrupted and where we actually do see major threats also fueled by disinformation, yeah. uh, manipulation of elections, you know, really the, the sort of core of, of those values that I had never hoped to see yeah, yeah. disrupted. And how, how do you uh, prevent successful businesses that have, you know, smelled the profit and will probably not be dissuaded from this scaling and disrupting kind of path. So this is, listen, uh, <clears throat> today I was in the board meeting of a company last night and we were talking about the ESG strategy, okay? And always, every time I hear the word ESG, I'm like, well, it's well-intentioned. What is ESG for the people who don't Environment, know? sustainability, governance, yep. uh, as sort of corporate uh, boards do. And every time I hear that word, I always think about what's well, too late because you're trying to bolt on a set of outcomes in an organization and a culture that wasn't from the beginning built the way you're describing it. Mm -hmm. So our, our focus is what are the inputs that go into company building? Let's get it right from the beginning. If you think about the next 10 to 20 years, our entire focus is about the next generation, mm -hmm. okay? The next generation of companies, because think about the Fortune 500, it's gonna look very different in the next 20 years. If we, if we can get the next set of companies right, so that they are building with the right sort of core responsible innovation frameworks, we're gonna set it on the right path, where it's not just about profit pool maximization, it is about shareholder, stakeholder value maximization. And then on, on that same, in that same vein, I think the next generation of entrepreneurs and the students today are also 
uh, folks that are thinking about this and care a lot about these issues. And I know you on campus deal with this. Maybe you want to talk yeah. about, like, where, what is that movement coming that hopefully can help us set on the right path? Well, it's interesting because we actually both teach at Stanford. It's kind of a coincidence that we're both uh, on this stage right here. now. Yeah. Um, but I see a lot of idealism among students and a real desire to build different services, different companies, and to have a more, I would say, purpose-driven career. But there's also a harsh reality of student debts and fantastically lucrative offers from tech companies that uh, there are just few public organizations or civil society or government jobs for that matter that can compete. And so I'm wondering, is there something to be rebalanced between those excessive profits and those Fortune 500 figures that we now see? Do you, do you think that um, more responsible innovation will lead to a sort of balancing out of whatever the highest income and the lowest income within a company are? Or is it going to be so successful, as you said, you are a venture capitalist, you're in it for profit, that those companies will be equally profitable, but just with a different societal impact? I think they'll be more profitable. I, I really do believe that if you build with the long-term interests of society in, in, in the core problems that you are solving, I think you'll in the end have businesses that are going to grow for a lot longer than others do, right? And, uh, and so, uh, I, I mean, I, I think this next generation implicitly understands that. They care about the planet. They care about the stakeholders. Uh, they have a greater sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and frankly, the tools for innovation are available to all of them and are only getting easier. So my hope is that this diaspora goes and starts a lot of companies and, br and brings the, that mindset, the mechanisms, the intentionality to building these companies because those, that's how we build the next set of companies that set us on the right path, with, that harmonize, that bring economic opportunity to everybody, that take care of the planet, yeah. you know, and, and that, um, frankly, every time we use the word AI, we talk about, oh, what's gonna happen to jobs? But that's up to us, what's going to happen in jobs. This is a workforce transformation opportunity. And I think this next generation cares deeply about that as well. <clears throat> yeah, I hope so. I think there needs to be attention on both sides. So I don't think we can just rely on people to make the right investments in the most responsible companies. I think there's also need to revitalize governments and to bring talent in so that there can be a better uh, understanding of how technology impacts you know, all of society and to make sure that there is a, a proper democratic answer to that disruption, whether it's intentional or not. So I'm curious when you talk about the next generation, when you talk about your focus on responsible innovation, what kind of companies are knocking on your door? Or what are they creating? You know, <clears throat> the last um, year and a half has been amazing um, because uh, every part of society, every part of the economy out of necessity has had to innovate, right? So we're big investors in, you know, companies like Stripe that are sort of indexed to e-commerce. Obviously, almost all commerce got accelerated online, so we've seen lots of innovation there. Healthcare has been transformative. We actually think that's the sector that probably has the biggest uh, a transfer of um, uh, innovation uh, towards what we call health assurance, which is you know, reduce the cost of overall health care, keep people healthy, uh, and also leave nobody behind, which obviously is, is an issue that we saw this time around in pandemic. Um, FinTech, I believe, is going to continue to be very interesting in that regard. And, uh, um, and then you have you know, certain sectors like security where a lot of bad actors have also behaved a certain way and you know, that opportunity is out of necessity fairly deep over the next several years too. So it's, it's the best time, it's the golden era for innovation. I think it's an opportunity for all of us to set it on the right path as well. And that's, that's a little bit of why, frankly, I'm here, you're here, you know, sort of just raise awareness that uh, you know, we've got a great opportunity, but also a great responsibility over this next decade. Yeah, I really appreciate how you're talking about making sure that no one is left behind. I think that that is also the, the you know, billion dollar task of our, of our era, uh, to make sure that the use of data doesn't become a class issue, access to healthcare and other public services doesn't become a class issue, or... I mean, yeah. uh, on this, I'll tell you, over the last year, every time somebody asks, how are things going? I always say two things. Business is amazing and society is in turmoil. And that is not a harmonious state. 
Right. Right. I mean, that's the reality of this. When you think about what has happened, the technology industry, the venture capital industry has done incredibly well. But when you think about many, many stakeholders in, in society, they're hurting, right? And so, A, that's not going to uh, persist. Something's going to break. And B, none of us are going to feel great about, hey, that's our legacy on the other side. Well, I think yeah. it's kind of painful that there's so much profit in, in some areas, but that the cost of what is not functioning well, like you know the depletion of public resources, the lack of good uh, access to healthcare, education, infrastructure in many cases, um, questions now that are new about saving the environment and how the cost is going to be uh, equally uh, shared. Um, are incredible challenges before us. And so you've given me hope that there are people in the investor community and in the business community that actually think that solving these massive problems are an opportunity. And uh, maybe we should meet back here in five years and reflect on, uh, on whether there's a better balance, more inclusion, and uh, less people left behind. Let's hope so. All right, yeah. that was it. Thank you so much. Thank you.